So thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be again in Japan at the hackathon. And I will talk about uh, learning from different types of data that we use and that we deal with. I will talk about learning. I will talk about learning. <laughs> Sorry. Yes. Um, I will talk about learning from different types of data that we deal with, um, all of us, together. But before I do this, so the task was its 10th year anniversary of the hackathon. So I was trying to look back. This will be my seventh hackathon. And I tried to, to see what I was doing for the past six years. And actually, different things. My first hackathon was in Kyoto, and it was essentially converting GFF3 to OWL and having some converter. The same thing for Mesh to OWL, which you still find in BioPortal sometimes as RH Mesh, And build a tool for Ontofunk, which did enrichment analysis over all kinds of ontologies. Then in Toyama, basically worked on semantic similarity and some Sparkle. Tokyo converted UMLS in OWL and had a converter for this, kind of was obsolete because they kind of at the same time released UMLS in RDF. And did some phenotype stuff in Matsushima, was corals and biodiversity for fun and then started working on some machine learning. Nakazaki was haikus. Um, and some work on upper OWL and Uniprot uh, in OWL. Um, just to build very big ontologies. And then last year in Tsuruoka, mainly some machine learning again. And there are three main themes. So one is, and this is kind of what uh, motivated also the talk um, today and the topic. So the three main themes are first is ontologies and knowledge representation essentially not necessarily dealing with just representation of the data, but dealing with the semantics and adding more semantics to that. And the second one is some form of analysis and discovery and building or using what we are building for discovery. And there are some tools for this. And then some fun. So uh, definitely haikus. Um, OK. What I will talk about today is um, so ontologies and RDF and Sparkle and the technologies we build here, they're used in more or less every basic every major biological database. And even if they are not based on RDF or represent their data, they will use ontologies in one form or another. So the methods and the technologies we build, they're very widely adopted. But there are very few methods, and it's a recurring theme here, um, that people say, OK, it would be really nice if all this work, all this effort that we put in linking our data could actually be used for knowledge discovery and for finding something new and do some biology or biomedicine um, with that. But the methods that we have are very limited. We essentially have two methods which somehow utilize these resources. And this is more or less enrichment analysis and then semantic similarity. We have seen a lot of applications. And it's not that they are, they are bad methods, but it's a bit limited. And I start with the hypothesis that we do need better methods if we want to make our resources that we build based on the technologies that we build useful to biologists and lead to discovery. And I will mainly talk about, by, by data analysis, I will talk about predictive models, but it can also be used for other things, for, uh, for statistical analysis and so on. And they should be based on the te technologies that we are using and that we, are, that we are, um, um, have adopted here as a community. So it should be based on semantic web technology. And let's outline the problem. So this is part of a graph. It can be an RDF graph. We can, uh, we can have uh, integrated this. It might, not actually, it might not actually be at one single site. This graph could, have, um, could span multiple different uh, endpoints or multiple different stores. It's all fine. What would we actually need if we wanted to predict something new about, say, FOXP2, that gene? What would we have to do? And first question, if we want to build a machine learning model for this, would be, well, which features are actually relevant? And when we try to find which features are relevant to make such a prediction, is FOXP2 involved in some disease? And we want to build a, a machine learning model for that. We start extracting features. And extracting features is something that we do by hand, uh, or a lot of people do by hand. 
When we go there, it's like, eh, maybe functions are somehow relevant to do that. So let's encode functions, but we kind of need to find a special way to encode for functions because there needs to be this subclass relation. We have to take account of this. So we write a script. And the script will go in there. It might parse this graph, parse the RDF. Then it will transform it. And it will identify exactly what we need, represent the features in a very particular way. Whatever model we are using, we might need a different representation. Then we have to do some mapping. So possibly somebody else, we have to do a mapping for a feature. That's all very, very tedious. And it's exactly what we do not want to do or what we try to avoid. But it's what we would have to do if we want to use this for machine learning. And last by a hackathon, ha hackathon, we work on a method for unsupervised feature learning for knowledge graphs. And we are not the only people. So there are more methods like this, which can take these graphs as an input and generate or learn representations of nodes and relations, which we can then use for machine learning. So this is um, one thing. The second thing is, these also need to take account of the semantics. We spend a lot of time adding semantics to these graphs. They might be rules, or they might be uh, encoded as axioms in our ontologies. And we also worked on this by incorporating inferences by deductively closing this graph. And essentially, and this is just uh, repeating from last hackathon, we uh, implemented an iterated random work from each node. Then we just used basic word to back to generate representations based on the context. So basically, we used the skip crumb model. We did this because the random works, they will actually reach out further away from each node. Um, we applied automated, uh, automated reasoning to deductively close this graph. And then we used it for, for different types of prediction. And these are some of the predictions. So this is also published in Bioinformatics. Nuri also already mentioned this. Um, so I will not go into very much detail. But there is one more thing. We do not only have graphs. So a very large part of our community works with many different types of data, most notably text. So when we look at text, so this is at the bottom, this is kind of the, it's a corpus of works which we generated by the method from last hackathon. First one is from an extract, uh, is an abstract or a sentence in an abstract which also talks about the same protein, 4cat bo uh, box P2. And we have also built methods to identify that Fox P2 is a particular, we can normalize this to Uniprot uh, and, and so on. We can uh, normalize our diseases, schizophrenia, to disease ontology or to MASH or to UMLS or whatever we have built our methods for. And we also have COPRA, which are annotated, already pre-annotated with a number of different methods and mapped to a number of different uh, resources. And here, the hard part is still, we want to somehow combine the information in text and in our graph to build a model which can utilize both kinds of information. And what we have done um, is, well, if we can identify every mention of an entity in our graph, we can just rewrite it so that essentially we rewrite the mention so that it will essentially become the IRI in the knowledge graph so that they are token identical. Well, and then we can do exactly what we have done before and we have tested this. So on Medline, so we have taken all of Medline, pre-annotated with Puptator. Sorry, no Pup annotation, but we can work on this during the hackathon. Um, so we have done this with Puptator. We rewrote them, so basically made them token identical. So we got this normalized graph, uh, so we normalized the text to our knowledge graph. And then we did feature learning as before, only we have two options. Either we concatenate our corpus, learn our, uh, apply our word to back model on this whole corpus, or we just do it separately and uh, concatenate the vectors so that we have two or somehow combine the vectors. We tested this for, for finding gene disease associations. And what you can see here, this, uh, this uh, uh, violet line in the middle there, this is a semantic similarity measure. And if we only use our graph, so if we only use our graph, that's uh, the blue measure. It's actually the worst performing one uh, here, just based on some similarity prediction. Text is the, orange, uh, is the orange curve, which actually works really well. But when we combine text and our graph, we actually get the best performance for this. And it shows that there is some complementary information in either our, gra uh, in our graph and in text. And this is quite nice. So in general, 
we have different types of data and different ways in which this data is represented. And we can, uh, we can learn from both of them in different ways. We can have uh, information from text databases uh, together and build joint models. And more generally, we would want to normalize our data across the different ways in which they are represented. And we already have these methods. Then we can map each of these data points to a vector space. And then we can combine them uh, there, or we can combine our models. And we have also one case where this is quite interestingly applied. And it's an entirely different application. And this is when we want to learn how to classify something with an ontology. And we have all these ontologies and most of our, the most informative statements we can make about an entity, say about a protein, is that it has a certain type of relation to an ontology class. It might be a function, it might be a phenotype, it might be a disease, but these are the statements for which we usually want to make a prediction which can then be tested experimentally and so on. And it's very difficult to do this because it's generally a multi-class, multi-label, very, very large-scale problem where there are a lot of formal dependencies. And the second one is we also want to use different types of data for this to make this prediction, and we need to combine this. And we have tested this with one case, and uh, I just give you one example here. This is for protein function prediction. On the left-hand side, we basically take a protein as its sequence, map it to a vector. We take our networks where this protein is embedded, map it to a vector, we can concatenate the vectors. So this is just the first multimodal part where we have different ways of representing entities, either as a graph based on their interactions or as a sequence, as a string. Concatenate these vectors. This is how we represent all these different pieces of information, all in one model here, but uh, it can also be separate. But then what we have done is we have encoded the dependencies of the gene ontology these are essentially, this is a deep neural network model at the bottom, it's a little bit hard to read, uh, which encodes for the dependencies within the gene ontology and uh, that are known about the annotation. So if uh, primarily if you're annotated to one class, then you must also be annotated to its superclass and uh, whatever this class is a part of and so on. And we have done this just by maximum merge layers as part of this deep neural network model so that this optimization problem is constrained by the axioms in the gene ontology. And we have tested this, and there, there are some other advantages. It, uh, it's a multimodal model. It also does a, a single optimization over Go. And we tested this for function prediction. Um, and we compared this against BLAST, because uh, there's about no function prediction method available for which you can get the code. Uh, almost no. So there, there are very few. So And we, we perform a lot better than blast to go for this. Um, we also perform better than uh, the winner of uh, Kava 2, which is a function prediction uh, challenge. So it actually, just solving this ontology part uh, on function prediction can help us a lot already. So the multimodal part and uh, uh, neurosymbolic consistent prediction will improve the performance already, even with just some very naive features that we have used. Um, so we can do this. Um, okay, I, I, I said this. Now the question is what am I going to do or what would I like to do at this hackathon? And in some sense I think from a methodological side we know how to represent our data. So technologically this is solved. So we have RDF and so on. We also do this for metadata, at least for the content thereof. Of course there are still a lot of work to be done on metadata standards and representation and uh, Mark and many others will work on this during the hackathon. But technologically, uh, we at least have the methods to do, so, to do that. And the key question is really if we want to discover new knowledge from what we are building. So new biological or biomedical insights. Um, what do we need to do and how can we improve that? So how can we make it easier to discover new things from the resources that we are building? And hopefully without the need to download, parse, extract, transform, and so on, as we currently have to do if we want to train any of these models, because they generally need a vector of something, and we do not generate vectors. And even if we can represent our data or transform some graph into some vector, it needs to be a, somehow a useful vector which has certain kinds of properties. And this is kind of what we try to minimize. And this is what we try to minimize in queries, but it's also something we should try to minimize when people need 
want our data and build some model with it. So the question says, can we use these unsupervised feature learning approaches? As we tried at last hackathon, um, can we make them available directly with the datas, uh, databases and the linked data sets that we built? And if, for example, we have in our Sparkle endpoint for Uniprot or for Biota RDF, not if we could for every IRI of an entity in an endpoint also get a vector-based representation. Basically, we now, and all these methods, take our graph and the information in our graph, map it to some kind of vector which we can then use in order to build our model. Can we eliminate this step at least for some shallow kinds of analysis. And this will probably lead to new kinds of analysis of our data, which also helps us to improve our resources. Can, for example, be used for visualization. Um, you probably all have seen some visualization of word vectors in some kind of two-dimensional space. And we can do this for our whole graphs. And we can also do queries, different types of queries based on similarity within these vector spaces. So there are different kinds of queries which directly emerge if we have these kind of representations associated with the data that we generate. And then there's a second part of this, and it's these methods, the models, and the features that we do generate and that other people generate. Uh, can we make them more fair? At the moment, if you want to find a machine learning model and reproduce it, it is incredibly hard to reproduce the results people have done, even to generate the features that people have used, and they wrote a paper about it. It's incredibly hard. And then the question is, for this, to make it findable, we need some kind of either repositories or some kind of registry for the features and for the models and for the results, so for the output of these models that people have produced. Um, we also need some kind of standards to annotate them. So for example, what does this model take as an input? What does it actually uh, do as an output? What is the transformation that this model is supposed to do on the bio bi biological side? And for this, there's nothing there as far as I know. If you know something, please let me know. And um, so this is something which is completely missing. And it's something where we are, pre uh, we are essentially in an ideal position to start something like this. And we also need this for different data types. So does our model take a graph? Does it take text? Does it take an image? And I have not talked about image, but I know there will, uh, Klaus will talk about images later on. Um, and it's directly relevant to this as well. And then there's the question of whether or not this can actually add value um, to our data and to, to the resources we provide. And I think this is something that I would like to find out this hackathon. And I'd like to really thank all the hackathon, uh, biohackathon organizers, the whole team, and the whole community, because this is going to be my seventh hackathon, uh, hackathon and it's one event I'm looking forward to for the whole year. Um, I have. I also want to thank Michelle because I have worked with Michelle for the last seven, uh, six hackathons very closely. I have worked with many people, but I think uh, one person I worked with uh, was Michelle. And last year, and most of this was started last year at the hackathon also with Akira Kincho um, and Nuria, and uh, then also some people at Kaos. Thank you very much.